can Continue. interrupt me. I've been married hey. 43 years, so. Okay. And, um, okay, Mark, take it away. Thank you. I want to start off by thank you very much for this uh, invitation to share the information that I've been accumulating over the past 42 years of practicing, uh, 30 years of dealing with uh, hormones, and then the past 18 years specifically dealing with neuroendocrinology. Neuroendocrinology is that field of science that that looks at the integration between hormones in the brain and how it influences our personality, uh, our cognitive ability, and how, in fact, these hormones called neurosteroids, how they influence repair in our brain. I mean, we look at uh, hormones, whether or not it's testosterone, estrogen, progesterone, pregnenolone, whatever. We look at these hormones as being uh, uniphase, where it's... Uh, procreative, it's uh, male, it's female hormones, it's procreative sex hormones, whatever. But it turns out that all these hormones are pleiotropic, pleiotropic in the fact that they have a multitude of benefits throughout the body. And a couple of slides throughout this presentation will, uh, will address that. But the real issue, uh, the Millennium is a network, a network of well-trained healthcare providers from all walks of medicine who saw that there was a challenge in treating patients with symptomatic TBI, frequently referred to as PTSD, which I absolutely do not agree with the terminology. I don't agree with any labels for anything that I'm going to be talking about, but I leave them in there so that there's a common ground of us to connect on. What we saw was this unyielding suffering of many civilians and uh, veterans who continue to uh, agonize under the conventional pro, uh, paradigm of medication, medication, and sometimes even more medication, as uh, uh, William just told us about Cymbalta being a great drug instead of testosterone. Well, in 2004, the millennium started the process of unraveling the causation using the brilliant science of hundreds of researchers in the growing neurosciences. The science is already there. I just read it and applied it in translational medicine format. But year after year, the Millennium improves their diagnostic parameters. We have a very unique uh, biomarker panel, a 28 point, which is extremely um, uh, well honed at being able to identify people with uh, traumatic brain injuries uh, from the past. And there are markers that you can pick up where it actually shows the disturbance in the brain's ability to make all these uh, hormones. So with that said and done, let's get into uh, the thicket of it. So how trauma, the primary injury, generates neuroinflammation, the secondary injury leading to disruption of the balance between the brain's hormones, neurotransmitters, the immune system, and the overall chemistry, neurochemistry, predisposes each person to a neuropsychiatric condition is the focus of this presentation. How this neuroinflammation creates the psychiatric uh, parameters that are presented as any of the labeled depression, anxiety, bipolar, obsessive, compulsive, and so forth. Learning about the impact, and I hate using that word impact, uh, especially when I'm speaking about traumatic brain injury, but it's an appropriate uh, double entente of a word. So learning about the impact of free radicals, oxidative load, and activation of the microglia, the immune cells of the brain, which precipitate the release of cytokines, chemokines, and leukotrienes, provides us with an understanding of the causative underlying environment that should be our focus to maximize treatment recovery, thereby maintaining a high level of human performance. Historically, we have learned that medication only masks the expression of these underlying biochemical uh, responses and nothing, does nothing to correct them and in fact, makes things even worse. So when we think of neurotrauma, it includes a primary trauma, usually a physical one with or without loss of consciousness that induces a cascade of secondary trauma. It is within the scope of these secondary traumas that inflammation precipitates neurochemical disruption exhibited as emotional and cognitive impairment. Depending upon the nature of the trauma, the course of the secondary trauma can be either acute or chronic. The transition from acute state to a chronic one can be facilitated by 
poor lifestyle habits, social environment, and repetitive trauma, which are exacerbated by psychological stress coinciding with an elevation in cortisol and a reduction in the chemokine called fractalkin, which we'll talk about a little bit more down the road. When a primary trauma occurs acutely, and depending upon the nature and severity of the trauma, a contusion of the brain can cause hemorrhaging that increases the intracranial pressure, causing compression of blood vessels, leading to ischemia, hypoxia, and hypoglycemia. As the pressure mounts, it can impair the glymphatic system's ability to remove the toxins, these toxic materials, which can rapidly increase more oxidative stress. During this acute phase of trauma, CT scan, possibly followed by an MRI, can pick up a basal fracture of the skull, contusions, hematomas, subdural hematomas, free blood, enlargement or compression of the third ventricles, and cerebral edema. But they cannot show us about the developing neuroinflammation. As the secondary trauma evolves, mitochondrial dysfunction increases, adding to the production of reactive oxygen species, which further impairs mitochondrial ATP production, promoting breakdown of cell membrane functions. Elevated oxidative stress activates more microglia. Toxic inflammatory free radicals cause lipid peroxidation of the cell membrane, inducing the, what's called the toll-like 4 receptor to activate the pro-inflammatory cytokine transducer that you might know as NF-kappa-B. At this point, neuroinflammation dominates, responding to increased uh, psychological and physical stress, cortisol continues to rise, reducing neuronal production of this product called fractalkin, an important chemokine that suppresses microglial activation. So as cortisol goes up, and everybody would stress, cortisol level goes up, fractalkin level goes down, and you activate microglia that start dumping pro-inflammatory cytokines in the brain. So as the brain's immune system goes into this hyperdrive, a uh, chronic phase of neurotrauma ensues. Neuroinflammation is impairing the frontal lobes and the limbic system, causing impairment in judgment and decreased cognitive functioning, executive functions. Neuropsychiatric symptoms are being uh, expressed by the injured for the first time in their life, usually represented by depression. The brain's glial cells have activated a chronic state of inflammation, and the repair protocols that were initiated with the start of neuroinflammation have failed, and the risk of scarring called gliosis or astrogliosis are hindering the brain's ability to rebuild neuronal connectivity, axonal really connectivity, through the process of synaptogenesis. Additionally, by this time, disruption of the hypothalamic production of signals to the pituitary gland leads to deficiencies of our brain's neurosteroids and neuroactive steroids, which only makes for a greater level of inflammation and neuropsychiatric dysfunction because these, as I said earlier, these hormones help to reduce inflammation. They counter inflammation through their one of their multiple pleiotropic effects. We are now aware that many of our pleiotropic hormones made in the brain, the neurosteroids, help modulate many neuro, uh, cerebral functions that influence not only inflammatory processes, but who we are and how we perform. When we compare the rate of cerebral atrophy occurring during the normal aging process against what happens post-traumatic brain, it is clear that trauma greatly accelerates the rate of cerebral degeneration, atrophy of the brain that we see in uh, x-rays of young people after multiple traumatic brain injuries, as well as in elderly people. Acute neuroinflammation protects the brain while chronic neuroinflammation destroys it. Clearly the benefit of a healthy immune system is to protect the cell from pathogenic attacks by viruses, bacteria, and molds. Ideally, when the immune system is activated, its goal is to eliminate any threat, any of these threats. In an acute conditional scenario, activation and resolution of inflammation can occur in days to weeks 
with possible subtle symptoms like we might experience with a common cold, irritability, lack of hunger, um, lack of libido, uh, irritability, as I said. And these are what happened in acute phase also in traumatic brain injury. In scenarios that chronically, uh, that chronically activate the immune system, the microglia, the astrocytes, the inflammation is more pervasive, leading to prolonged and more significant symptomatology impairing performance. Just a note to those who receive a copy of this lecture, uh, the red arrows in the lower right-hand corner are found on just about every slide is a hyperlink to an article used as reference for anything that I might say on any particular slide. Also, fair warning, due to the uh, convoluted nature of innate immunity and the neuroendocrine system, there will be some repetition of inflammation uh, or information uh, but taken for different perspectives. So I apologize in advance if it seems like I'm echolalia or redundant. It's just to make a point from a different view. Um, this, uh, this presentation will provide the science that the Millennium has used for more than 27, it's 30 years now, to develop and implement uh, laboratory testing that directs uh, our treatment protocols. In a nutshell, I can sum up this entire lecture with these three uh, statements. Neurotrauma induces neuroinflammation. Neuroinflammation alters the neurochemistry pathways leading to insufficiencies of neurosteroids, neurotransmitters, enzymes, cytokines, chemokines, and regulation of bodily functions. And three, prolonged loss of healthy neurochemistry gives rise to neuropsychiatric and neurocognitive dysfunctioning, dysfunction culminating in neurodegenerative illnesses like AD, PD, MS, and ALS. And I know I sent out, uh, I know Bill, you received it, a video of a 94-year-old patient, 93-94, who had... I did. His dementia is gone six months later and his work skills at 94 now, just yeah. impressive, very impressive. Yeah, I did. You did get it. Okay. So atrophy of the brain caused by chronic states of microglial activation is responsible for the progressive loss of subcortical regions of the brain containing the diencephalon, pituitary gland, limbic system, and basal ganglia. Uh, let me go back a second. Um, let's see. Oh, down here. Uh, one of the, I said earlier that, you know, after years, you can pick up the inflammation and uh, the activation of inflammation after trauma. They've done studies 17 years after the TBI, they're still finding interleukin-6 and tumor necrosis factor alpha, which are early key markers of damage to the brain. 17 years plus, they can find it. Okay. So atrophy of the brain, as you can see, each of these areas is important for normal um, neuropsycho behavior functioning and damage here can lead to uh, significant uh, specific problems. Limbic system involves behavioral and emotional responses. Obviously the pituitary gland uh, releases eight trophic hormones to regulate our hormones below the neck. So you lose these things. And another issue in, uh, let's see, as a sidestep, uh, the hypothalamus uh, it does regulate pancreatic production of insulin, and they found that inflammation of the hypothalamus can lead to excessive release of insulin. So that type two insulin resistant diabetes might be just a you know uh, a symptom of the uh, inflammation that's going on in the hypothalamus. Okay, so as we start to understand the impact of neurotrauma, we see that there are many deep structures. We uh, Deep structures. Let's see. Pro-inflammatory cytokines. Let's see. I'm missing a slide for some reason. Might have taken it out. Uh, let's see. Sorry. Um, anyway, so neuroinflammation as traumatic brain injury. These pro-inflammatory cytokines that are produced by the microglia and the astrocytes, and also some of the neurons and endothelial cells 
which will take a, um, a sedentary, they call it an M0 glial cell, and turn it on. And when they turn it on, it starts the process of dumping these pro-inflammatory cytokines into the brain. Okay, so as neuroinflammation continues, important enzyme systems are and neurotransmitters, synaptic vesicles are dysregulated or chemically altered. Uh, this leads to changes in uh, neuronal behavior, uh, in uh, neuronal behavior, as demonstrated by the frequency of, uh, of um, depression. And one of the issues that happens is this inflammation will interrupt the ability of our brain to convert L-tryptophan into serotonin through damaging to, damage to the enzyme uh, called L-tryptophan hydroxylase. And then the same inflammatory cascade can interrupt the conversion of serotonin to melatonin, and that's through the L-tryptophan decarboxylase. And that's what leads to all the head trauma patients have three very classical uh, presentations, depression, insomnia, and fatigue. And that fatigue is generated by the backup of L-tryptophan. We're getting into Thanksgiving. How many people you know, eat turkey and end up with a little sedation? It could be the beer and the five bottles of scotch, but uh, leads to uh, sedation. And that's the L-tryptophan. And it's because the L-tryptophan is converted to uh, nilorixic acid, nilaronic acid, which a uh, study out of Japan, Takahura, uh, talked about how we should be measuring this uh, naluronic acid and not serotonin as a marker of uh, depression. And it's more valid than uh, the um, use of, there it is, tryptophan, that's the pathway, is more um, uh, indicative of uh, depression being generated by this issue with tryptophan hydroxylase. But that's the uh, kineric acid right here. And kineric acid appears to cause the, um, the major depressive disorder, not serotonin decrease increase. And you know, that article that came out of England in what, 2020, 2021, that did a study looking at serotonin levels that are high, levels that are low, levels that are in the middle, and people without depression. And they found people without depression had low levels, similar to people with depression with low levels, and they found people with depression with high levels. So, you know, the reliance on serotonin SSRIs and everything as the cornerstone for our treatment for depression is out of science. It's out of vogue. Okay. So, the mechanism uh, by which these effects occur is through this thing called uh, uh, proxynitrite. And proxynitrite is a nasty um, reactive nitrogen species that damages all the systems in the body. Loss of neurotransmitters, synaptic vesicles, exocytosis, getting the neurotransmitters into the little vesicles and spewing it out into the synaptic cleft, loss of pre- and postsynaptic receptors, loss of uh, synaptic enzyme, and accelerated metabolism. Accelerated metabolism is what commonly happens when you put a cell phone up to your brain and uh, it accelerates the um, use of carbohydrates, uh, glucose, and leads to damage to the cells. Every time you put a cell phone up to the brain, creates major damage to brain cells. Um, so five-year study uh, of anterior pituitary function after traumatic uh, brain injury um, found that after head trauma, that there was head trauma with disruption of the blood-brain barrier, that there was a significant occurrence of autoimmunity against the hypothalamus and the pituitary gland. And a classical uh, case is with uh, Sheehan syndrome. They went back and did a major study on those women who had given birth and ended up subsequently with partial or total hypo um, pituitaryism, and they found all of them with antibodies against the hypothalamus and the pituitary. And in people who aren't, you know, the other people that can't give birth, um, you know, when they have head trauma, 
uh, they have been measured to have high levels of um, autoimmune antibodies. So as the production of reactive oxygen species, reactive oxygen species uh, and reactive nitrogen species, the proxy nitrites, rise, they damage every uh, system in the, in the body. And you see that DNA is affected. It causes uh, interruption of the uh, unfolding of DNA and the refolding of it leads to lipid peroxidation on the cell membrane with fatty acid loss. Lipid peroxidation will lead to triggering of NF-kappa B and through something called the toll-like 4 receptors, which are uh, amplifiers of to the production from 450 genes of pro-inflammatory cytokines. Also degradation degradation of uh, proteins and fragments, peroxidation and modification and inactivation of proteins. Those proteins that they're referring to are the neurotransmitters. Okay, so just to be fair to reactive oxygen species, which are neurotoxic molecules that exert their effects on oxidation, it appears that if they are in physiological ranges, the reactive oxygen species can help to improve synaptic plasticity and to normalize cognitive functioning. So the level, it's all about excess versus sufficiency. So if we have you know, processes of uh, reactive oxygen species being generated, which happens every time you generate ATP, there's a benefit there. Okay, nearly 98% of TBIs occur in uh, the military and uh, they're closed uh, head traumas um, of the type. In these cases, early intervention to neutralize the propagation of free radicals can provide a degree of uh, neuroprotection and reduce the neuropsychiatric sequelae. The recognition that there are two sources of these neutralizing antioxidants, uh, the endogenous ones, the ones that are in our body, which are represented by glutathione and superoxide desmutase, SODs in the brain, which are made throughout our body and are the first line of defense against free radicals and the endogenous ones coming from our nutrition and supplements that may include omega-3s, the EPA, DHA, fatty acids, which are very good, quercetin, uh, PQQ, which is the sister to CoQ10, but it's 100 to 1,000 times stronger in terms of uh, mitochondria genesis, uh, free radical scavenging, uh, and ATP production. So PQQ is very good. Also vitamin C, but not the traditional vitamin C ascorbic acid, but ascorbate palmitate. Ascorbate palmitate with palmitic acid on it is the only vitamin C which gets absorbed directly into the brain. And what are the benefits of vitamin C? It upregulates uh, glutathione um, synthetase so you can make more glutathione. And it also regenerates um, uh, vitamin E, uh, cough rolls. It increases that. Um, in uh, those who might have know, uh, know uh, Colonel Dr. Michael Lewis, now in retirement, his book, When Brains Collide, he presented his thesis on the benefits of therapeutic amounts of omega-3s to proactively protect the brain of active duty service members from their traumas. And the stuff works. Okay. So elevated levels of oxidative stress induces a state of chronic, inducing a state of chronic inflammation or pro with these pro-inflammatory cytokines can be pathognomonic for a group of neurodegenerative diseases as are indicated here. Uh, this article came out of a laboratory specializing in oxidative stress and they identified three key means to reduce the size of our oxidative load by lowering the environmental exposure to toxins, the air we breathe, the burn pits out in the, the Middle East that our soldiers are now finally gotten their funding for, uh, using nutraceuticals that can enhance the body's ability to detoxify pollutants and by enhancing mitochondrial energy production. This mitochondrial energy production is a key facet for uh, helping with recovery uh, not only of uh, 
enzymatic and biological pathways in the brain, uh, but by also repairing the actual brain itself, neuronal uh, repair and uh, synaptogenesis. So this is peroxynitrate, uh, represented both a pathological or pathophysiological endogenous cytokine at high concentration, uh, agent against pathogens at a lower concentration. So at a small concentration, the normal level, it helps to kill bacteria, viruses, and molds. At a high level, kills the brain. Now, the importance of peroxynitrite cannot be understated as a disruptor of critical neural pathways. Peroxynitrite is formed by the combination of nitric oxide and by the superoxide. Now, in those people who use spec scans to analyze brain functioning, and you see those punched out areas, those punched out areas are not trauma. Those punched out areas are diminished uh, blood flow. And that diminished blood flow is due to the fact that this reaction steals nitric oxide, which in the brain is important for vasodilatation. So you lose that. So this is a, a picture, TBI spec scan, that basically shows the same thing, where on the left side, it's a normal, untraumatized brain. And on the right side, where it obviously says abnormal, you see these punched out areas, which are representative of um, uh, diminished blood flow because the uh, isotope that's used on the um, for the spec scan uh, attaches piggybacks onto red blood cells. So it, what you're actually seeing in this picture is the confluency of blood flow throughout the brain as it emits its uh, gamma, I think it is, radiation. Okay, so cerebral metabolism is highly active and requires 20% of the body's oxygen while the brain only represents 2% of the person's total weight. Thereby, the high level of cerebral metabolism gives rise to large quantities of mitochondria uh, reactive oxygen species while, trying to, while generating ATP. With elevated oxidative stress, several endogenous protective mechanisms kick in, as I stated. Unfortunately, they don't work that well because peroxynitrate actually uh, it selectively inactivates glutathione reductase, thereby reducing uh, regeneration of glutathione uh, from its oxidized form. More so, it appears that the effects of peroxynitrate on the glutathione system shows to have a predilection, a specificity for the substantia nigra where dopamine is produced. And that is a selective damaging to the dopaminergic or dopaminergic uh, neurons that can lead to Parkinson's. And how we've been able to reverse Parkinson's is by stopping peroxynitrite and stimulating the brain to produce more, um, more dopamine. And that's through something like um, pregnenolone. Testosterone increases the production of, um, of uh, dopamine, and it also upregulates testosterone, upregulates the dopaminergic receptors. That's why it's very important. So one step further, peroxynitrate has also been shown to regulate pain influence through these TRP channels. So when you lose the TRP channel, what happens is this dysfunction has been associated with neuropathic pain, inflammation, and reduced ability to detect taste or hypogousia. Now, where have we heard of hypogousia? Well, it's because of this effect of high peroxynitrate, shutting down TRP, allowing for greater pain perception and its effect on our tongue. So something that we have seen in long haul conditions caused by Delta variant of SARS and nowadays just about anything. So the sedentary sedentary M0 is uh, the microglia phenotype can be rapidly induced to become the activated form, the M1, and start dumping all these inflammatory cytokines. It can be biological, biochemical, physiological, and obviously other pathological conditions such as stroke, radiation exposure, as well as lack of neurosteroids and neuroactive steroids that can induce the system as well. On the left of the chart, there's the pro-inflammatory moving to the right. You see inflammation and then anti-inflammation. There are 
cytokines that are called anti-inflammatory. And to boot, the most potent anti-inflammatory is IL-10, interleukin-10, and it's stimulated by testosterone. So lacking testosterone puts you at great risk for all these uh, pro-inflammatory uh, neurodegenerative diseases. So fractalkin is a representative of the immune system's chemokine family, which has been in the literature for about nine to 10 years. Fractalkin is a ligand produced by neurons, astrocytes, and, uh, and endothelial, some endothelial cells and acts to suppress microglial metamorphosis from the M0 to the M1 phenotype. This is a form of surveillance state, the M0, uh, which it's looking for things to attack. And once it finds something, it's off and running. It appears that exposure to stress causes an increase in cortisol, which decreases the fractalkin, leading to increase in cytokines. So I had the head of uh, Baylor Medical Center, uh, Baylor um, Military VA uh, DOD TBI PTSD Center, and she calls me up, we're having a conversation, nice gal. And she says, uh, um, and I say, look, I'm a New Yorker, I shoot straight. And I knew she was the head of TBI PTSD. I said, I don't believe in PTSD. The phone goes dead. She comes back and she says, why? And I said, tell me everything you know about Fractalkin. And she's in Texas, she's got nice Texas twang. She said, Fractalkin? I said, yeah, tell me everything you know about Fractalkin. She says, Fractalkin? I said, yeah, what do you know? She said, absolutely nothing. And it's because we just learned about this nine to 10 years ago, how it regulates the ability of the microglial or the glial cells to dump cytokines under stress. So you can have someone who has 100% stress and they'll develop symptomatology of what they're calling PTSD. For me, PTSD in my veteran population and in the civilian population uh, is a was a missed opportunity to have treated an early TBI. Because think of it this way, TBI, a little fire is set in the brain. Now you have a choice, you can put it out or let it go. If it's let to go, it starts growing. And as the fire grows, it damages more and more structures in the brain. And that's why you start having these, you know, expansion of these neuropsychiatric conditions that they are calling PTSD. It's just your missed opportunity to treat a TBI. Um, how's my time? Okay. So uh, supporting the fractalkin theory of microglia regula regulation uh, is that only microglia express the fractalkin receptor. There might be three cells that generate fractalkin, but only microglia have the receptor. And microglia have recently emerged as cellular effectors linking the influence of their environment to resulting modifications of brain function and behavior, actually through stress. So under optimal conditions, astrocytes, part of that glial population, monitor their immediate environment, picking up GABA agents, potassium, glucose, all these things here, and helping with vascular tone. But when there's inflammation, wham, all these inflammatory chemicals start being released, damage to all these symptoms, the glutamate, noradrenaline system, neuronal hyperactivity, so they get twitchy, uh, leukocytes uh, increase, you get all these inflammatory cytokines, okay? That's what happens when you incite them through inflammation. Now, this glymphatic system, I mean, in a class, I would ask how many people knew about the glymphatic system. Well, it turns out that this glymphatic system, as it states, was discovered in animals in 2015 and in humans in 2017. So that's what, six years that we've known about this glymphatic system. And the glymphatic system is regulated by astrocytes. So you damage those astrocytes, you've lost this filtering system that will extricate from the fluid in the brain, the uh, cerebral spinal fluid and so forth, all these inflammatory damaging chemicals. And what happens is they accumulate as well as, as fluid can no longer exit the brain, it increases the edema in the brain. And that adds to the intracranial pressure issue. Um, the recent, this uh, 2019 article addresses 
what has been unfolding for decades that neuroinflammation can exacerbate or initiate neuropsychiatric disorders. It's about time that we start seeing articles that are clearly putting the two halves of the puzzle together uh, to help support people like, like myself that 18 years ago started approaching things from this uh, avenue. So we'll state a little bit about uh, neurosteroids, which are a class of steroid hormones that are produced de novo in the brain and have important functions in regulating neuronal activity. This um, neurosteroids were basically brought to the forefront by a doc by the name of Belou, Belou in uh, Paris, uh, not Texas, Paris, France, uh, which began in the early 80s. He found that neurosteroids are produced in the brain by glial cells from the substrate cholesterol. That's why you're now starting to see these incredible studies saying that low cholesterol is not good. And that's because it helps with all these neurosteroids in the brain. They're 35 plus. They're not just below the neck. So the diversity of function of these neurosteroids is broad as well as specific. They are tasked with jobs of keeping our neurological functioning at its best through protection modulation of function and repair. And looking at uh, the brain, um, the frontal lobe, which is the most traumatized, if you look at statistics on which lobe of the brain is most commonly in traumatic brain injury involved, it's the frontal. The same thing with blast trauma in our veterans, the frontal lobe. And look what, the highest concentration of P450 is in there. And P450 is the uh, inducing um, enzyme that takes cholesterol and starts the process in the inner membrane of the mitochondria to produce pregnenolone, which is called the mother of all hormones. So neuroendocrine disruption also leads to loss of neuroactive steroids. Those steroid hormones produced in the glands below the neck that gain entrance into the brain by way of the blood-brain barrier. The majority of them have to be actively transported except free testosterone. Free testosterone through a gradient goes into the brain. That's why it's this, this thing of total testosterone is bull. Total testosterone should be scratched off the list and it's only free testosterone because that's the one that gets into the cells to do the work. Total testosterone is what? epitestosterone, DHT, estradiol, bound uh, forms of testosterone. Anyway, okay, so this was 10 years ago, the mechanism by which neuroinflammation interferes with hypothalamic control over the pituitary glands production of FSH and LH was reported. They found that neuroinflammation alters the production of astrocytes prostaglandin E2. And it turns out that this PGE2 is required by the hypothalamus as a cofactor to release gonadotropic releasing hormone. Now, the gonadotropic releasing hormone goes to the anterior pituitary and has a generate and release luteinizing hormone to produce, you know, in the thacal cells of a woman, their testosterone and then estradiol in the Leydig cells of a male's testes to produce testosterone. And neuroinflammation shuts down this glial production. Right now, what we're dealing with in our practice is all the guys and gals that are coming to us post-vax with this scenario, not from trauma, because they found that the spike protein accumulates in the brain and leads to inflammation in the brain. Some people develop the post-vax or long COVID, and it's due to that issue. So sterility and hormonal deficiency. With the hormonal deficiency, you'll see depression. With sterility, you'll see depression. Everybody wants to be a parent, or most everybody. So cytokines belong to the tumor necrosis factor alpha uh, family, which is inducible transcription factor uh, and it activated uh, by stimulation of TNF, uh, tumor necrosis factor alpha. Specifically, TNF alpha releases NF kappa B from its inhibitor protein, which they call uh, I kappa beta, allowing it to translocate into the nucleus where it triggers additional pro-inflammatory 
cytokines. Once NF-kappa B translocates into the nucleus, it can regulate over 400 genes associated with immunity, growth, and inflammation. And aside about the, about the adhesion molecule, molecule beta-2 integrin that's highlighted here, this is responsible for the accumulation of leukocytes in the lungs, which causes COVID, you know, cytokine storm that happened in COVID. An article that was published during this peak of COVID was delayed by a year and a half because it told how to reverse this by the use of the neuroactive steroid DHEA, which significantly reduces leukocytes adherence, leukocyte adherence to pulmonary mucosa, lessening the intensity of the storm. In the brain, sulfated DHEA, which is the active form in the brain, is a neurosteroid steroid that drops the production of interleukin-6, thereby reducing the intensity of the cytokine storm in the brain. So getting your patients up there on DHEAS is very important to reverse this process. Another great article, uh, just loved it because, you know, playing the blues. Uh, another great article, which is Cytokine Sings the Blues, is a good read since it uh, presents an in-depth understanding of how inflammation begets uh, depression, as well as other neuropsychiatric conditions. And if you click this, I'll make arrangements for Bill to get a copy of this. And if you click this, it takes you to the full article, not an abstract, not one of those limited teasers. This is the full article. Okay. So uh, the theme here is very straightforward in that for all forms of inflammation create a damaging environment that the, that the brain uh, floats in. It is this abnormal environment that alters brain's ability to glean benefits from medication. So that's the reason why we have a lot of failures of medications, uh, failure of neural feedback, failure of hyperbaric oxygen, failure of light therapy, and uh, also treatment uh, with psychedelics. I just published a new article on how neuroinflammation disrupts or inhibits, impedes the ability of um, psychedelic assisted therapies for maximal benefits. It's at the website. So studies have shown that cytokines produced below the neck, uh, produced below the neck, like secondary to gut issues, autoimmune diseases, Crohn's disease, rheumatoid arthritis, psoriatic arthritis, and so forth, uh, uh, can create what's called the sickness behavior with hypersomnia, fatigue, lower libido, irritability, and sometimes fever. We have seen the syndrome frequently in uh, long COVID. Uh, long COVID and autoimmune diseases. What's neat is medications like Embril, which block interleukin-6, and then they have another one that blocks tumor necrosis factor alpha. And when you use it, their autoimmune disease subsides, and you see this reprieve from the neuropsychiatric condition because you've dropped the inflammatory cytokines. And in our population, my daughter does it uh, because of her focus on gut brain and uh, gut health. Uh, she'll run people through something called a, um, a GI map, phenomenal test. And she'll find the things that are causing inflammation of the gut, whether or not it's dysbiosis, leaky gut, uh, malabsorption, whatever. And there are markers unique for inflammation in the gut. And that might have been the reason why in my treating them, they did not get 100% better. But once they get their gut addressed, they come up to closer to 100% improvement. Okay, individuals who develop symptoms like sickness behavior without a history of TBI should have their gut looked at. And this is basically what I already said. Okay, so both physical and biochemical changes induced by traumatic brain injury can disrupt the sympathetic nervous system, leading to excessive release of catecholamines, epinephrine, norepinephrine, and all the things that increase fight and flight and create the um, uh, dysautonomia uh, syndrome. On Yeah, syndrome. I've, uh, I think I posted on my website. It's a two-minute uh, video of specifically this um, condition with heart rate variability getting off and fix the inflammation. It gets better. We've got guys who have hypertension on three medications that are barely working, they get their inflammation taken care of, they're off their blood pressure medication. 
And here's a 2017 article from uh, the UK. And what they did was they looked at psychiatric disorders and they looked at the elevated cytokines. And what seems to be consistent is the interleukin-6 and tumor necrosis factor in schizophrenia, depression, bipolar, anxiety, OCD, and what they call PTSD. So a comment about this toll-like receptor 4 that I commented about earlier, where you know, gram-negative um, pathogens like E. coli trigger it, and um, peroxidation, uh, lipid peroxidation will trigger it. Very few things trigger it. And it turns out that if you use narcotics, opioids, that it has a crosstalk between the mu receptor for modulation of perception of pain. It doesn't do really anything pain except make you think that it has. And it crosstalks with toll-like receptor 4, which triggers NF-kappa B to translocate into the nucleus to induce transcription of pro-inflammatory cytokines, and you end up with more pain. The way that we've addressed the, uh, the pain scenario is to fix the inflammation. And that's how we've been able to uh, neuropathic pain. I'm giving a presentation to uh, Georgetown on neuropathic pain, which is this scenario with the uh, proxy nitrite. You adjust them, you lower the opioids, and you can do away with pain. You can improve the pain scenario. So all metabolic pathways are dependent upon the presence of adequate amount of mitochondria-derived ATP, the energy molecule for all cellular functions. It is with ATP that NF-kappa B can translocate into the nucleus with a potential of turning on uh, 400 different genes. The same ATP can also be used to drive repair mechanisms, transmembrane ion transports, and protein synthesis. NF-kappa B has a direct and indirect effect on the functioning of mitochondria and therefore an effect on their ability to produce ATP. So when NF-kappa B enters into a mitochondria, it damages cytochrome C required for oxidative phosphorylation and it also causes the mitochondria pores to open up. And when these pores on the mitochondria open up, the cytochrome C exits and initiates apoptosis. Regulate inflammation, you improve that. So mitochondria dysfunction, there are some of the things that it does, damage MDA, activate cap spaces. Cap spaces like cap space three, they're called the messengers of death. The minute they're turned on, the cell's dead. It will force them into the process of apoptosis. Okay, fortunately, when the level of oxidative stress reaches an apex, certain redox signaling molecules like nitric oxide will induce uh, transcriptional programs for mitochondrial biogenesis. So even though you've got these damaging effects of uh, proxy nitrite and heavy oxidation, it will trigger for a secondary system, which is nitric oxide, which will save the day. Well, not save the day, but it'll improve the outcome. So under this uh, program, mitochondria are generated to help in the repair process for in re improved uh, ATP production. In looking at a uh, prevalence of uh, TBI in terms of acute and chronic and its influence on hormone production, you see acutely in three months, you've got 56% hormone deficiency, and these are the percentage of uh, each that is deficient. And then there's an improvement, and by 12 months, you've got a 20% improvement, and these people go on to develop chronic. And this is the population of people that I see mostly is one year uh, usually one year and more after their uh, trauma. And they've been through, you know, lots of docs and they still haven't seen the light of day. And we run tests that have not been run before. We find the problems, replenish it, replace it, they get better. And we also address the inflammation at the same time. Now here, hormones that influence neuroinflammation. Uh, what I mean is by dropping uh, the negative ones and increasing the positive ones. Growth hormone drops C-reactive protein, drops tumor necrosis factor alpha, and increases the, the most potent anti-inflammatory uh, interleukin-10. And you can see IGF-1, testosterone, all these have benefits on uh, 
all the pathways or many of the pathways that create the triggering of traumatic brain injury, inflammation, neuroinflammation. And you see pregnenolone and allopregnanolone. Allopregnanolone comes from pregnenolone through progesterone. And pregnenolone is 80 bucks a year. And it becomes allopregnanolone. A pharmaceutical product called Zurosa came out five years, six years ago for a slim $34,000 a year just for the medication. And then about $80,000 more for once a month being in the hospital for 30 hours, getting a slow IV infusion. So you just use progesterone or pregnenolone, excuse me, pregnenolone to get the benefit. Okay, we're almost at the end. Um, we already talked about testosterone and improvement. It also uh, directly drops all these pro-inflammatories. Uh, let's see. Yeah, drops all those as well. So summation, any form of trauma will increase the production of free radicals, thereby elevating the level of oxidative stress. The rising oxidative, uh, oxidative load activates microglia. It's probably the number one activator of microglia is, are the pro-inflammatory um, oxidative uh, free radicals and induces the production of uh, pro-inflammatory cytokines. In an acute process, inflammation does its thing and then it gets turned off by the presence of these anti-inflammatory cytokines uh, indicating resolution of the threat. But as I said, it's not always that way. Many of the traumas that are perceived as being acute in nature can be insidious and indolent like the stealth syndrome that they talk about until symptoms relative to cognitive mood and libido become problematic. And this represents the chronic phase of the condition. Within the conventional approach, a neuroendocrine assessment is rarely performed. And when it is, it is very limited. And to some degree, they don't interpret it to the degree that our software does. This is why the mainstay of treatment is based upon medication that masks the symptoms because they haven't figured out how to treat the cause. So based upon the results of a 28-point biomarker panel, a customized we do a customized treatment protocol is designed that rep replenishes the neurosteroids that are objectively found to be deficient along with the neuroactive steroids that are below the neck while addressing neuroinflammation. Key to hormonal replacement is that they are replenished to the therapeutic level, not just within the box. They have to be to the therapeutic level, which is the second to third quartile of the range. So doesn't matter what my range is, you just look at the quartiles of your laboratory's ranges. So inflammation and mitochondrial functioning are con concurrently addressed with nutraceuticals like CoQ10, PQQ, and so forth. So, you know, without electricity, lights go dim and then they go off. And this is our 2019 to 2021, 840 clinical cases. And we do what's called the monthly program report where they fill out 25 points of um, subjective assessment of psychological, physiological, and physical functioning. And um, this is the percent uh, that were 10% better in that time frame. 19 people, and how many people were 50% better, 60, 70. So it turned out that 78.3% of the participants participants were 50 to 100% better within an average of 12 months on a protocol. So um, that's, that's it. So if there are any questions, um, you know, you'll get this and see that there's a software package. It took me nine years to write a software package. I was in computer electronics before my father died of bone cancer that threw me into medicine. So this is a um, computer software that analyzes your labs, uh, not just TBI. It does TBI, wellness, anti-aging, age management, does all of it and interprets it and gives you a 12-page report telling you not only what it diagnoses or finds, but also what it recommends to treat the patient. And then, uh, yeah, we have a new online course, seven lectures, it's over 16 hours of um, uh, training with 600 articles with red arrows, and you can download them. You can put them into your collection. So that's it. I'm going to stop sharing. And uh, let's see, I don't oh. have my... 
my scotch here. Hi, Hyla. How are y'all? Hi, Meisel. You're doing great. You're doing great. Hi, great, great as always, Mark. Um, well, it, you know, the bottom line is my passion here is because I'm hoping that someone will pick up this passion and take it to the next step and state doing like you've done. You've honored me by taking this information and disseminating it within your uh, your peers and your group of uh, colleagues here. And that is the reason why, you know, I spend it, yeah. so many days doing it. And, you know, you called me, said, can I do it? I'm here. I've got another one tomorrow with the military. Yeah, okay. it's, um, it, it actually takes, you know, what we've learned from uh, what I call hormone centric, uh, looking at, at uh, patient care to the really to the next level. It really gives us a, gives you a um, and, and these people get the thing is these people get better. Um, you know, a lot of if anyone's dealt with the head injury people, they um, they absolutely get better. You, you, we actually change lives. Um, and, mm -hmm. you know, how many how, seriously, how many die, at least uh, uh, the, in the on the medical side can say that I'm not talking about surgeons, but, you know, on the medical side. Um, I know I was many times said, and said, what am I doing? <laughs> what am I doing with myself? <laughs> um, and, um, then, you know, these folks show up and in three months, six months, nine months, um, you know, they go from, uh, uh, basket cases, living under a bridge, uh, uh, you know, estranged from their families, um, you know, totally useless to, um, mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, they, they get their lives back. And, uh, um, and, uh, so that's, uh, you know, that's, that's, that's what did it for me. Uh, Joel down here at the bottom, he was my first TBI patient. This is what he started it all. Um, yeah. and, uh, you see that beard that he has there. He, oh, he, yeah. he, he lets me talk about him. He had no hair. <laughs> um, he had none. No, he had no body hair, no head hair, nothing. Um, zero and, testosterone. What? Zero DHT. He had, he had, he had, you know, he, he wandered Nothing. in one day and he, for whatever reason, we hit it off and he started telling me, you know, his story. And I started asking, you know, the, the, the hormone questions and that sounds like testosterone. That sounds like thyroid. That sounds right. He was on with Joe, you can tell your story. He was on 13, uh, medications, 34, uh, pills a day. Um, and, uh, yeah, I got down to, I was about 140. 344 pounds mom moved in to feed me by hand just to keep me alive va said it was in my head dr gordon and that i was stressing and i need to quit stressing and i need to eat right. more. and it i had to break away to uh, uh whole foods and start learning about that whole situation and then i learned about judy mikovich and i learned about some of the corruption with big pharma and then by the grace of god we had a magazine with all those woo woo doctors in the back and that's where I found Dr. Clearfield and I went to him and there was another veteran that was already there that was diagnosed with cancer that didn't have cancer from the VA. And he told me to stick with Dr. Clearfield and it was just mind blowing. I, yeah. it was so, the anxiety was so bad that neurologically I couldn't breathe on, on rhythm. I had to count animals to breathe. <clears throat> it was just, it was, it was just disgusting. It was bad. Okay. And then when, once he got into your book and he started to really, you know, go into this, it was life changing for both of us. Point yeah. blank. Yep. Now I remember we, we, uh, so I said, we gave him, we, we wrote up a lab slip and he took it to the VA and they laughed at us. So <laughs> yeah, Joel, you know what I get? Happened to me. The, the, uh, a lot of our vets will take their report that we give them plus a copy of the labs to the VA doctor. And the VA doctor looks at it and says, I don't know how to read this. So then he gives them my, the interpretive report, uh, the, you know, our ML, MOA software uh, report. And he looks at it and says, wow, but they're not going to do it. They're not going to do anything. That's why it's taken me 14 years to get April of this year. I got invited to Walter Reed to lecture to the uh, functional medicine people and the head of the department, Dr. Spivak, liked the presentation. He didn't tell me, it was the my my uh, liaison that did. And I ended up writing a 10 page report. And that's what, this is the presentation I gave them. He loved it. And I took it and wrote a 10 page article on it. It's on my website. 
with, under the name, uh, neuroinflammation, the same name, I believe, neuroinflammation, the uh, road to neuropsychiatric illnesses. And next day he calls me up and uh, he says, we got to work together. Uh, so we have a project in uh, Washington in uh, February, talk about neuropathic pain and a little bit about uh, what we do. So I'm bringing my partner, Andrew Marr. Some of you know Andrew Marr, it's Green Beret, who in his fourth tour of duty was blown up and ended up six months later on 13 medications, full-blown alcoholic. And that's the movie wow. Explosions, if you haven't seen it on Amazon Prime, it's three bucks, okay? And it talks about uh, not only him, but uh, there are 10 cases. Uh, I have a very small uh, part to play there because it's not about me. It's about hope for the people like you, Joel, and others that have experienced the effect of traumatic brain injury, which uh, brings me, can, can I answer some of these questions so I can go and have yeah, a dinner? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Also? Okay. Yeah. Um, you know, the first question is, what is the mechanism of Cymbalta and lipid changes? Why well, that wasn't that, that's that was, your question. I, 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 those I, I, had to, I had to look that. I had to look that up myself. I, I I'm not an expert on this. I, all I did was look it up and, and found out that Cymbalta raises cholesterol levels. That's a, that's okay. all I know about it. So, okay. Uh, if anybody out there knows knows the answer, let me know. If not, I'll I'll I'll, I'll report next time. <laughs> so, yeah. uh, I can see the questions here. Do you want yeah, me yeah, to go down? Cool. Okay, yeah, yeah. the question. Yeah, the question about Sheehan syndrome and autoimmune TBI. Uh, is it uh, considered an autoimmune TBI? Well, if you look at the the core, Dr. Sheehan very clearly showed that there was a damage to the stalk, the vasculature to the stalk, the uh, pituitary stalk that leads to loss of um, blood flow to the anterior pituitary, and that's how you lose uh, some of the cells there, the somatotropes, gonadotropes, and so forth. The ones that occupy the front uh, half of the pituitary are the growth hormone ones. So those are the ones that get nailed first. So in the order, if you look at the literature, growth hormones, number one, testosterone, number two, with the gonadotropes, number three is thyrotropin, and number four is cortotropin. So ACTH is affected. So it goes through that pattern. So um, Sheehan syndrome is primarily a vascular compromise with a secondary issue of um breakdown of the blood-brain barrier because the astrocytes, the inflammation that's set up by the ischemia that occurs to the tissue of the brain contiguous with the pituitary stalk releases blood. Now in blood is hemoglobin. In hemoglobin is iron. Iron causes what's called the Fenton reaction, which is an incredible inflammatory trigger. So that's how you end up getting the inflammation that leads to the damage to the astrocytes, which leads to, you know, breakdown in the um, in the um, in blood brain barrier, um, blood brain barrier. So that's how the peripheral blood gets into the brain and initiates um, an autoimmune response. Because as you know, Everybody. say again. So the um, the. Uh, the brain and the prostate are sequestered tissue, meaning they have a very protective mechanism. And that's why, you know, when there's breakdown in the uh, prostate uh, protective outer wall, you get things like prostatism, you know, nonspecific inflammation. It's an autoimmune process. In the brain, we're now seeing with all these head traumas, occurrence of autoimmune. Okay, next, uh, what about PTS symptoms in non-TBI patients? Well. Um, we have uh, this fractalkin issue. We're under stress, no trauma, just stress. What happens is fractalkin drops due to elevation of cortisol and the microglia or the glial cells, the astrocytes and the uh, microglia are turned on and start dumping inflammation. And it's that inflammation that leads to setting fire to the brain. Just like being hit on the head, blast wave, um, certain medication, exposure to ionizing radiation, these all induce the same mechanism. Different pathway, you know, they say all roads lead to Rome. So different pathways, but they all create the same scenario. If you go to my website in uh, March, I did a paper on uh, off our veteran population where we looked at 
79 veterans that had randomly come into the study. And we looked at them who had, by the VA, a diagnosis of just TBI and who had a diagnosis of PTSD. So we have two groups. And what I did with the PTSD group is I looked for how many of them who had a TBI someplace before their enlistment, playing football and MMA were the two most common. And all of them, 100% of that group had a TBI. So I had already treated them, put them onto a treatment protocol, regardless of TBI or PTSD. And the results were in one year, 77% improvement in, and I'll clarify that in a second, 77% improvement in those with uh, PTSD and a 77.4% in those who had TBI. Now, what improvement is for us is 50% to 100% improvement. If our patients do not achieve 50%, at least 50% or more, we haven't um, really fixed them. And what we found in a lot of my time is looking at why that group did not do well, why that group did not at least ascend above 50. And it turns out alcohol, lifestyle, poor nutrition, poor hydration, no exercise, no relaxation, no meditation, um, drugs, alcohol, um, medic no, I said medication. Uh, oh, gamma pent gabapentin, horrible absolutely horrible stuff uh, because it screws up the entire pro, uh, pregnenolone, progesterone, allopregnanolone, and pregnenodiol pathways. And you need all those for the brain. So uh, that's TBI. Cutoffs for cholesterol, that's, that's a loaded question. In order for cholesterol to move forward to make hormones, you need to have luteinizing hormone. So the rear, real issue is not how much cholesterol, but how good the level of luteinizing hormone is because it's the rate limiting hormone for cholesterol to be converted to pregnenolone. So you need to you know, look at luteinizing hormone. Uh, there are studies that talk about less than 160 being associated with cognitive impairment. My mother died from statin dementia and she was put on horrific levels of statins and the real issue was her hypothyroidism. The asshole up in Beverly Hills did not even look at her thyroid. I looked at it and found that it was low and started her on you know, appropriate T3 uh, protocol or um, combination therapy and started kicking her off all the statins and stuff she was on. I didn't get involved with her medical care, which was my error. Anyway. Um, Let's see, a uh, low close copy. Yes, uh, I will make a copy of, um, of uh, this presentation and you'll have access to the clicking code, the, the down arrow. I'll make it available to anyone who donates to the Warrior Angel Foundation. Okay, we usually put the uh, video on, on our website. Is that okay or you want me to hold, hold off on Video, that? what video? We're videoing the, we, you, you've been on video since we started. Oh, okay. I mean, as long as you give my good profile, do it as you will. <clears throat> okay. And I was just kidding about the donation, but I'm self-funded. Everything I do goes into our veterans account. My um, uh, partner, Andrew, has a 5013C Warrior Angel Foundation. So every year I transfer funds from what we've generated in our practice to him. I leave a little bit to buy one bottle of scotch and... Um, he gets funded, you know, as a 5013C uh, or C3 or whatever it is. Uh, can I get a copy? Yes, you can. And that's, oh, Dr. Spector. Uh, I'm very enthusiastic. I see three psychiatrists here. That's which good. is great. Yeah. Which is great. We're we've making, got, making progress. <laughs> we've got, I think, in total about 29 or 30. We just got uh, one in Florida and one in Georgia. Okay. Uh, let's see. Have you used or heard of MERT magnetic E? Yes, I have. I just gave a lecture to um, to the International Society for uh, Biofeedback. Is it, uh, 
Yeah, neurofeedback and um, and research. Uh, yes, I do not use any of these modalities. I refer them out to other people after we fix their neuroinflammation, because what we find is that if they have neuroinflammation, you won't catch the, you won't be able to uh, man, uh, maintain the beneficial effects from all these protocols, not unless you fix the fix the brain and get the chemistry. In the movie Quiet Explosion, there's uh, a surfer by the name of uh, Sean Dollar who had 80 sessions, he talks about it, he had 80 sessions of uh, HBOT. And two weeks after stopping, he was feeling great. Two weeks after stopping it, he crashed and burned. His doctor, uh, Scott, uh, Scott uh, Shear and Dr. Um, Daniel Amons, they ended up referring him. To, and we did our laboratory testing and found deficiencies. And once we got him onto replacement, two weeks later, he's doing great, except he was told, don't go back surfing. What did he do? He went back surfing. He crashed and burned. Why? He was adrenal insufficient. And the adrenal insufficiency was from all the time that he had been stressing from his his trauma. Uh, let's see, low dose naltrexone. You know, low dose 4.5 or is it 2.5 or 1.5? I don't know what low dose is these days. But um, the article that's there about uh, narcotics inducing the toll-like 4 receptor are real. So every time you use something like naltrexone, or a low dose narcotic opioid, you're actually increasing their brain's inflammation. So you've got to find a balance. Yeah, they might feel good. They might feel better, but you're persisting. And the way you can check it, which I don't really like, is with uh, IL-6 and a TNF-alpha test. Uh, oxytocin uh, help with TBI. If you're deficient in oxytocin, um, yeah, that'll help. Um, if you're looking generically at peptides, you know, you've got the um, uh, ARA290, you've got the CMAX, you've got the NAC CMAX, you got the CMAX acronyl, uh, which are peptides that work. Uh, they're very good. Uh, um, I like the, um, the uh, thy uh, thymosin uh, 500 or 4 beta. I like that because it helps cells repair but you have to use it in conjunction with our, our, either our protocol or with other um, other uh, peptides. You ever use cerebralisin? Say again? Cerebralisin. Cerebralisin, yeah, I know about it. Uh, I was like, you know, where it was coming from out of Russia, uh, cerebralisin, I was a little bit concerned, even though they said they did test it for prions and all that because it comes from animal eye products. Uh, I think we have uh, safer peptides, okay? Go look at the origin. The other thing is, uh, what lab do you, what labs do you run to assess the level of inflammation? Great, great question. And that is Zoom user, okay? Thank you, Zoom user. I don't use, do any inflammatory cytokine testing. And the reason is straightforward. Where are interleukin 1, 6, tumor necrosis factor alpha, where are they produced? Throughout the entire body. So how can you tell me that I'm doing a blood test and that's from the brain and that's giving me selectively just about the brain? That's not the case. We did a, a, a six-month uh, six um, study on our veterans, uh, stuff the cytokine testing is not cheap. Um, and what we did find is that if there is cytokine interleukin-6 and tumor necrosis factor uh, alpha were elevated and we lowered it through our treatment, they got better. But I can't tell you categorically that this is from the brain. As I said earlier, cytokines coming from the gut or cytokines coming from an orthopedic joint can generate and go right into the brain and induce the inflammation. So I don't do any uh, inflammatory markers. Yeah, you can do your C-reactive protein, your homocysteine to make sure you're not adding to the inflammation. But the, the real issue is I don't do that. 
And what I do do is from that article that came out of uh, 2013 talking about neuroinflammation shutting down uh, gonadotropic uh, releasing hormone, and you'll have low luteinizing hormone and low uh, follicle stimulating hormone. That's what I run on. I run on that pattern there. And then also there's the um, Jostel index, which is commonly called the TSH index. It's a mathematical model that looks at the relationship between TSH and T4. And if the mathematical model calculation comes out 1.3 or less, the problem is with dysregulation of thyroid access is coming from the trauma to the brain. And if the TSH index or the Jostel index is greater than 4.1, the problem's coming from the thyroid gland. So you can pick up indications of um, Hashimoto's and Graves' disease. Another thing that the software, it's an AI software tool, uh, has done is showed us that if you have low vitamin D and elevated reverse T3, that you have a 70% concordance of picking up Hashimoto's. So our software does that analysis for you. So you just run it, it'll tell you, we suggest running a TPO or uh, the Graves antibody, the thyroglobulin antibodies. Let's see. Uh, routinely find pregnenolone near zero in patients. Well, partially it depends upon the technology that you use. Most healthcare providers trust in the laboratory, but they don't know what it is that the lab's doing. There are three standard techniques. Uh, the best one is uh, is um, the uh, liquid chromatography LCMS MSMS. It's a th three tiered um, anal um, analytical system that is the gold standard now. Uh, pregnenolone is added to it uh, just of late. And there's chemoluminescence and ELISA tests. And the worst one is uh, RIA. So if you look at the laboratory technology that your lab's using, you know, the low rung ones like LabCorp and, and Quest, um, you look at what labs they're doing or technology they're doing, and that'll give you an understanding of why might uh, these levels be low, okay? So if pregnenolone is low, the, the benefit of pregnenolone, it becomes progesterone and then allopregnanolone. You need to read about these three. The pregnenolone and progesterone and allopregnanolone have two halves of a puzzle. One half is it generates the, um, the GABA in the brain is one of the things that pregnenolone does. Another thing pregnenolone does is it upregulates acetylcholine in the brain. So you have patients with Alzheimer's and they give them what? They give them acetylcholinesterase inhibitors to stop the destruction of acetylcholine. And the reason why it really doesn't work is because there's no acetylcholine being made for it to work on because inflammation through the peroxynitrite shuts that off. So pregnenolone, anti-inflammatory on one side, on the other side, it's a free radical scavenger. It's synaptogenic, which means it improves the neuron's ability to communicate through synapses. It's neuroregenerative as well. So the pro product called Zurusa came out for postpartum depression, anxiety, and they haven't uh, started talking about sleep benefits, but incredible sleep. If you have low level of pregnenolone, your patients won't sleep. They'll, you know, I had a, a, a Marine come into the office and I asked, I had his labs in front of me and I said, so how's your sleep? says, how many hours? I say, how many hours are you in bed? He says, 13 hours. I said, damn, you must wake up feeling great. He says, on the contrary, I wake up feeling like I never put my head to the pillow. I'm looking at his pregnenolone level. He doesn't have any. Two weeks later, giving him uh, 100 milligrams, 15 to 30 minutes after dinner, he's sleeping like a baby. Also, migraines started to improve. Inflammation is migraines. Okay, uh, let's see, 4050, PTS with Sheehan, should we treat and assess them? Uh, with Sheehan's stroke, subdural hematoma, any process that allows for blood material,
to get into the uh, brain tissue, you need to address the inflammation. You need to douse it. You need to put it out. And what, since uh, uh, Bill William gave me a leeway, which I usually don't take, is we spent 16 years developing a product called uh, Brain Rescue 3. We also have Brain Rescue 1, Brain Care 2. Um, we have a product called Clear Mind and Energy, which we launched with the Navy SEALs and DAM in uh, Virginia Beach in 2017. Then our second product, which is purely the Clear Mind and Energy uh, cleans out the cobwebs. No caffeine cleans out the cobwebs by how it regulates nerve to nerve interaction. Um, we launched that with the SEALs in 2000, March 2017. In uh, May of 2000. Uh, 19, we launched our Brain Care 2, which is purely our anti-inflammatory product. And I list on my website, you can see everything that's in it. I don't hide anything. What makes our products work is a patented delivery technology um, that came out of Israel. And uh, that allows our stuff to be absorbed without being destroyed by gut acid and gets rapidly absorbed because of the nano liposomal particle. So the uh, Brain Care 2, we did on a study with um, the medics out of Fort Campbell, Kentucky, 90 day program, 70% improvement in their symptoms. Um, they, uh, anyway, they connected me with their congressman in the state that they worked with a Dr. Uh, Mark Green in uh, Kentucky. Um, and then the last one was 2020 with the Brain Rescue 3. Uh, I lectured to them on one day. The next day, they send me a group of active Marines who are getting ready to be discharged, medically discharged. And you know how long that process can take, six months, three months, a year, whatever. And we put them onto a protocol of one product, no blood work, nothing. It's the Brain Rescue 3. They took it pre-breakfast every morning for 90 days, but every 30 days, they filled out an 18 point questionnaire that had psychological, physical, and physiological questions on it. Migraines, uh, pain, joint pain, body pain, depression, anxiety, um, sleep, quality of sleep, and so forth. 65% of them were uh, 50 to 100% better. 35% of them were less than 50%, 50% or less. And those are the ones that we ended up spending more time to figure out why. And it was medication related mostly. Um, PBM is TBI. Uh, what is, um, uh, Richard, you still there? What is PBM? Is he allowed to talk? He's allowed to talk. Okay. I don't that, know. Uh, right. Hey, yeah, I'm how are you, Richard? How are you? Nice well, to see you. It's, PBM? Uh, photo, PBM is photobiomodulation. Okay, got it. You can go back into uh, uh, microphone off. Great question. Um, the uh, one of the um, veteran foundations called Gray Team out of um, Orlando, uh, Orlando, Florida, Florida. They support uh, PBM, and the way PBM works is the 940 angstroms of light penetrates the brain and shuts off. Uh, denatures um, the pro-inflammatory cytokines. So, so transcranially, you can actually influence the, uh, the amount of inflammatory uh, cytokines that are in the brain. So it's um, the uh, guy who founded it is uh, Harry Rebach. His father is, uh, was 93 when he came to us with dementia and uh, 60 days later, his dementia is gone. Now we're at six months and he's on television now. And his word skills, his cognition, his reaction, his response to the interviewer, phenomenal. So I don't know if you've gotten the uh, video. I sent it out a couple of times. It's a minute, 47 seconds. It's Edward Reebok. He was uh, army from uh, Korean War. He just turned 94 last week. Do they have to continue the PBM indefinitely to no. retain the effect? No, because they're on our, uh, I donate to uh, to them, to Gray Team, um, our two products, which is Brain, uh, Brain Rescue 3, they take it in the morning, and Brain Care 2, they take before dinner. 
and then they give them uh, their uh, photo uh, modulation, and they're doing really well. And he's keeping track of those that he puts onto our um, nutraceutical protocol and those that aren't to see how they respond. So they freely fund uh, the uh, photo modulation. Are you familiar with Dr. Nasser's work out of Boston VA? Say again. Dr. Margaret Nasser's work out of Boston VA. No, I don't. I don't follow that. What happens, uh, Richard, is you know they'll tell me what they're doing. I'll look up at the modality and what I look for are mechanisms. So okay. I find the mechanism and how it works, and I'm supportive or not. And she is the one who has led the movement for photobiomodulation. Okay. Yeah, and, and that's why that's why people like uh, Carrie needs to communicate with her. Uh, I, I'm just everything's falling off my plate right now. Okay. okay. Uh, can I repeat the Jostel index? Look it up. Okay. And I say that with kindness because it's an equation that you can learn and you can apply to your T4 and T3. And if, if it's less than 1.3, central problem. If it's greater than 4.1, it's a peripheral problem. So if you go on and look up the TSH index, it was developed by Dr. Jostel out of Chicago. And there are maybe oh, 10, 15 good articles. And almost every single one of them has the calculation. If you go and say uh, on uh, Google, you say um, uh, TSH index um, calculation comes right up. So you can get the calculation. It's um, yeah. 0. 0.13 five four times four five four five times the uh t4 plus the tsh, TSH. and right. that'll give it to you yeah those of you who've heard heard me speak on this uh yeah. especially the laboratory you, you've heard this before i yeah. called it the tsh uh, index like, yeah it's a, I, it's I didn't know it had a name i didn't know it had the uh, jostel index so. yeah it's a, that dr jostel Okay. So um, what I've written is a paper, um, a one pager for any of our veterans who are being denied disability. And I find that they have um, the TSH index indicating they've had brain trauma, head trauma. I'll send them the document and tell them, go read. Mm -hmm. Here's the science that supports it. Uh, let's see. Can you put your website with the products? Uh, let's see. Isn't there a thing here that allows me to? Yeah, yeah you type in the chat. I see it. I see it. Okay. So, um, www.tbihelpnow.org is the website with all the education. It's an educational site. To access the products, it's at um, www.millennium. Uh, Health, uh, Millennium Health Store. dot com, and if you go to the website and you check off a little box that says something, I agree to receive promotions and so forth. We send out maybe one educational a month, and with the educational, we have a code, and that code will give you a discount. The discount only works if you are a subscriber or check that little box. And the discount code or the checkout code is, um, checkout code is uh, MH, MH. Uh, oh, I know which one that's. It's phase 2022. There it is, the phase two protocol. We've got about 8,850 some odd people who are utilizing it through the website. And that's how I get funded because I'm self-funding to pay for 1,500 veterans to come into our uh, program. We pay about 60%. Okay, uh, a, question, you, David? There's a question on new, that you skipped over. What's your thought on New Dexta? I don't know what that is. New Dexta, I'm sorry. Uh, 
It is like a Dexta scanner or something. I don't even know what it is. So we'll just pass on that. Yeah, I'll I look do. it up to educate myself. In these forums, I get educated and I take advantage of learning these things to see if they yeah, are. I, I don't know. I never heard of that yeah, either. We'll there was another out. one you skipped. What if the TSH is very high, say around 20? Is there any indication from this? Or is it still depends on the ratios as mentioned? So uh, if TSH is elevated, this is one of the... Um, Quag, uh, not quagmire, but one of these processes to an, analyze it. What happens if TSH is elevated and you're now making great amount of T4 and converting enough amount of T4 to T3? Is there a problem with that? Let's say your TSH is seven. Most labs, it's what? 4.5 to 5 point something is the upper limit. Let's say five. So what if it's seven? Are you going to jump on and give them thyroid? Well, that's always the dilemma because the endocrinologists don't, that's all they look at is the TSH. And they don't, they don't, they don't know what the free T3 is. Correct. And they don't know what the T4 is. Well, my answer is no. That is compensatory hypothyroidism. The body is handling it. When should I step in? I should step in on two situations. One, if their prolactin is elevated because elevation in TSH causes elevation in prolactin. Elevation in prolactin shuts down luteinizing hormone and you can't make testosterone, whether it's thacal cells or Leydig cells. You can't make it. That's one. Number two is if their level of TSH is very high, and they're not converting comp uh, compensatory. They're not making enough T3. And if I'm seeing that their T4 is more rapidly converting to reverse T3, then I'll start looking at selenium. Selenium is a rate limiting for T4 to T3 that's functional. And selenium deficiency will cause T4 to go to reverse T3 as well as iron deficiency, ferritin deficiency, B12, B6, and elevation deficiency and elevation of cortisol will cause the preferential production of a reverse T3. So, and the best way to treat reverse T3 if they're symptomatic with low T3 syndrome because their T3, T3, RT3 ratio is less than one. And then you'll give them a little bit of pure T3, a quarter tablet of a 25 or have a compounded T3 and you use it for a couple of weeks. What does that do? Like homeopathy shuts down the conversion of T4 to reverse T3. And then you stop it during the time that you're giving them their selenium and making sure their B12, B6, B folic acid and ferritin and, um, and iron are appropriate. Uh, FYI, the selenium will also raise your testosterone levels by uh, up to 30% uh, do that? micrograms within uh, uh, eight weeks. And How does it, it do it? And it will also lower um, the thyroid antibodies. So, yeah. And how does it do that? I'm going to have it to, I'm going to have to remember that. I'll make it easy. It inhibits the 5 alpha reductase. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, what you have to do is you have to keep track of there are two pathways that 5-alpha reductase work. One of them is testosterone to DHT, and the other one is pregnenolone to allopregnanolone. And if you block that pathway too much, what will happen is you'll start getting symptoms of, allo, of deficiency of allopregnanolone, uh, which is depression, anxiety, insomnia, and mood swings, volatility, anger. And that's what prolonged testosterone treatment will do because it consumes the 5-alpha. Right. And then uh, for, for our, our sports fans out there, then what drug what drug also has the same effect? I know you know. <laughs> of which? Of the blocking, when you block the 5-alpha reductase, when you end yeah. up with the... Uh, 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 um, okay. Uh, you know, uh, emotional and uh, pro, uh, issues. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Body so that, issues too. Right. Those those of you out there in in, in cyberspace, you know what drug that is. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, uh, I think that we'll, we'll have yeah. we'll, we'll answer that quiz next week. So you'll have to come back. Which yeah. drug is it? Trenbolone. Huh? Yeah. What about it? Uh, it's a uh, DHT congener. 
Yeah, it's like uh, Nangelone decoinate. It's like Anavar. It's like Winstrol. It's like uh, Trivulone. It's like met, met, Mysterolone. All those things. Uh, used properly and blended with uh, testosterone, it's good because the problem with all the DHT congeners, DHT looking things, is they don't go into the brain. And what have we found? We found that when free testosterone gets into the brain, it converts to DHT. The other stuff doesn't get into the brain. So if you're only using nangelone decoinate or any of those DHT congeners, what happens is you starve the brain of free testosterone and you end up getting damage to the limbic system, the amygdala, and you get anxious, you get paranoid, you get, um, uh, what is it, uh, startle response, okay? You get an increased startle response. So if you're going to be using any of those D, uh, DHT products, always make sure you're putting in some sustenon or you're putting in some testosterone propionate or a blended propionate cypionate and you won't get into problem. I mean, my partner within an hour of getting his first shot of testosterone was better because we developed in 2002 a blended testosterone, 20% testosterone propionate, 80% weight per volume of testosterone cypionate. The cypionate takes 36 hours to separate from its ester. The propionate takes an hour to two hours. So you get it, boom into the system, goes right into the brain. He talks about it in one of our Joe Rogan sessions. So it, it really works well. Hey, Dr. Gordon, what, about, what about iodine? Um, you know, Stefan has done a beautiful class on this. Dr. Lewis is talking about it. Dr. Brownstein has a class. We know a Dr. Michael Nelson here in town. Mm -hmm. He has 12.5 milligram uh potassium iodide and iodine mm -hmm. pill mm -hmm. and I, I think it has something to do with everything that's going on with yeah. all the emfs and emrs yeah i used to dispense the low dose iodide you know in the past okay um, now i have it as part of one of our uh products so yeah but uh, iodine you just have to monitor it i mean have to keep track of it and you know if you're eating uh is it true that they're taking iodide iodine out of salt there was some article that i saw that they're looking at taking no, iodine no idea out. so yeah anyway but well, you know you eat properly you'll get exposure to it you know like uh sea salts real sea salts they've got you look at uh there's a product i'm looking at it has what 40 50 uh um minerals in it that's one of our problems is we're mineral deficient we're drinking Pounding water, distilled oh, yeah. water, filtered water has nothing in it. Nothing. Yeah. Nothing. You've got, and we've got, you know, from another company, we've got a multi mineral that works very well. I take multi minerals, you know, the drops, but. Right, right. Okay. Like but it, it, it has some iodide in it. Okay. All right. Anything else? Um, do you have any experience with exosome injections via intranasal injection? Oh, great topic. I'm just reviewing the literature on intranasal stem cells. But what's in stem cells? Exosomes. So if you got exosomes and you snort them, it should do basically the same thing. But there's a doc that I'm, after I read these papers, I'll interact with um, relative to uh, nasal snorted. I can't see snorting cells, though. You know, they squirt they it up. They, 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 they inject it with a, you know, with a syringe. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I'm not there. You know, in uh, 2000 and, um, 2013, I was in Dusseldorf doing third ventricle injections of uh, autologous stem cells that were augmented in Haifa, Israel, into a uh, brain, doing a project with a Dr. Haberling. You can look him up. And uh, uh, the patient had... Um, brainstem hemorrhage yeah, all the classical brainstem hemorrhage within three days they were disappearing he was still wheelchair dependent but his speech was better his hearing was better his mm -hmm. mobility in his body was much better he didn't need a retention he didn't need to drink his coffee with a straw it was quite impressive and then the german bundesrepublic shut down dr haberlin's uh, center 
He ended up in Turkey, in a hospital with Turkey with a tank in front of the hospital. I wasn't going there. So, yeah, but okay. uh, yeah, stem cells, exosomes are great. Peptides are great. Uh, you know, exosomes have more in one punch than uh, peptides do. And, you know, take advantage of the peptides now because the FDA is slowly whittling down our availability. Yeah. You know? Yeah. How about RG3? Uh, 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 as a uh, abbreviation, uh, I don't know that. And it was uh, RG3 oxytocin or RG3. No, with TBI. You know, if anything that you're talking about has influence over the inflammatory cascade in the brain, you'll get benefits. In our brain care too, is, which is the main anti-inflammatory is DHA, is quercetin, is gametocopherol, is um, ascorbate palmitate, um, is um, what else is in there? Uh, B12, methylated B12s in there. Um, one more that I'm missing, glutathione is in there. And each one of them has tens of thousands of articles talking about their benefit in the neurocircuitry. And I just read them and take it and make a product. And then we did, you know, 16 years of clinical testing on the Brain Rescue 3, eight on the um, Clear Mind and Energy. My daughter, my oldest daughter during residency, we came out with the prototype of uh, uh, Clear Mind and Energy. And she, uh, she says that her residency, internal medicine residency in Pennsylvania, she was able to get through it without a sweat because she would pop the uh, liquid, the goo. She called it the goo. It's clear mining energy. So it, you can read on the website, uh, you get the um, Brain Rescue 3 data sheet. It has all the products, all their composition. And That's do with it, you know, use it any which way. Mm -hmm. So let's see, five more... two messages. Oh. Are you saying you must give pregnenolone when you give testosterone since it soaks up the 5-alpha reductase? Is that what you're saying? No. If you give testosterone or estradiol, what key hormone is shut off? And that answer is luteinizing hormone. What's the function of luteinizing hormone? It's the rate limiting hormone to convert cholesterol to testosterone, uh, to pregnenolone, and then down the entire cascade. So if you give just testosterone and estradiol, you are shutting off 35 plus brain hormones. So what we do is we give pregnenolone and we give DHEA because they're at the top of the bifurcation. Pregnenolone becomes DHEA, pregnenolone becomes progesterone. Well, it becomes pregnenodiol and progesterone. So you Whenever you're using testosterone or in a male and estradiol testosterone in a female, you have to give pregnenolone and DHEA. Otherwise, run the risk of shutting down 35 hormones. And the classical symptoms are a guy will go to the doc four to six months down the road and say to the doc, you know, I felt really good at the beginning of treatment. Now I don't feel as good. The doctor says, okay, increase your testosterone. They're already on super physiological dosing of testosterone because they don't understand what the average production of testosterone is per day for a male or female that is strapping, he muscular, healthy, doing very well. And they up the testosterone. So a month to two months later, they're worse. And the doctor hasn't a clue as to what's going on because they didn't do their basic reading in negative feedback. It's all about negative feedback. You have to monitor that pathway. And everybody wants to skimp it. You know, everybody a, wants to skimp it. Yeah, Mark, what about the, the guys and in, in, um, estrogen levels? You know, the AMMG, there's, they're, 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 that's a hot topic in... Uh, I have yeah. a hard time wrapping my head around some of what's... Can't get over it, Bill. <laughs> no. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, what's his name? Neil Rousier was a great leader in uh, you know that issue. I don't mess with estradiol. Because if you looked at all the symptoms, all the systems that need estradiol, 
nitric oxide synthetase. In order to make nitric oxide, you need estradiol. In order for you to make growth hormone in the brain, you need estradiol. In the liver, you need IGF-1 and estradiol. Neuroplasticity is based on what hormone? Estradiol. The heart, the lining of the arteries, intima, estradiol. Bone, estradiol. So if you start messing with arimidex or anastrozole, which I never use, you run the risk of shutting down eight systems in the body. So what do you do? You adjust your testosterone level. You give them zinc, which blocks the conversion of testosterone to estradiol through blocking estradiol synthetase. You can use EGCG, you use pomegranate, you use a whole bunch of natural things to, to block it. But I have guys that are two to three times the normal level of estradiol. And they look at the number. I said, yeah, your estradiol is high. So they said, isn't that going to cause a problem? I said, no, because what counters the estradiol is the free testosterone. So if your free testosterone level is good, I don't worry about the estradiol, but I ask them, what symptoms do you have? And a lot of them will say none. The symptoms I'm looking for is nipple sensitivity, which is one of the earlier signs. They put on a shirt and it touches their nipple and it's sensitive. That is a clinical finding symptom of estradiol being too. I don't see it. I don't see it because their proportion of testosterone to estradiol. But, and if they're so concerned about estradiol and they're using anastrozole, they should look at the literature on neuropsychiatric damage from anastrozole. And it's all coming out of the fact that it screws up the chemistry in the brain. I've got a portfolio, you know, um, someplace down the road, I can send it to you and you can disseminate it out. Okay. So um, it's a link to um, uh, Google Scholar. And it's a, one of my searches in Google Scholar looking for patterns. And this is the... You can send it to me. We'll put it on our website and then we can... Yeah, don't can expect it, it uh, uh, until early next week or so. I'm, uh, I'm not in a hurry. <laughs> okay, good. But I'll um, get you this... Uh, I'll get you this... Um, uh, PowerPoint presentation. Uh, I'll try and get it to you tomorrow between my uh, work that I have tomorrow. I'll get it to you. Uh, it's, you know, it took me a long time to put this um, presentation together. Yes, we know. We, the articles. we and, know. We, we, we appreciate it greatly. No, no, that's not what I'm looking for. The point is, so the only thing I ask is that you take the effort and you read as many of the articles as you can because your knowledge of what this neuroendocrinology will just go skyrocketing vertical. And that's what we need. We need more people to understand that neuroendocrinology is where we all should be at, not at endocrinology. Endocrinology, you know, for those of you who have, you know, who aren't uh, healthcare providers that have gone to a traditional endocrinologist, you know, it's crazy. It's absolutely crazy. I, it, every day I hear from you know, my vets about, uh, yeah, they were sent to an endocrinologist and I showed them what you put me on and they said, it's going to kill you. So I say, okay, get them, you, Pete, Joel, yeah. Get from them what will kill you and how and what the mechanism is. And they come back with air. You know, it's like the other pet peeve is you've got our patients who are on age management, anti-aging, whatever you want to call it treatment and they need a surgery so what does the doctor do the doctor says oh you're on any supplement yeah stop them all and then you ask the doctor uh why do you want me to stop my my this or my that oh it's going to cause complications can you give me one article that talks about it oh no i don't have any you know it all generated from two cases where someone had a facelift and bled more they were on uh, supplements and then there was something with um two it was a it was a cosmetic surgery and an orthopedic surgery but it had nothing to do with it you know they're just trying to point the finger at someone else's fault oh it's your vitamins that did it you know but then they turn around and say the vitamins don't do anything anyway right, oh. <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah they say that it's a waste of the pharmaceutical companies but 
in uh, what was it when um, Larry King, Larry King was on, he had uh, throughout the prior years before this date, he had docs coming on basically saying, you know, from all the television shows, the docs representing the Channel 4, Channel 2, CBS, NBC, they were all saying vitamins are expensive urine. And then literature comes out showing that it isn't. And you see them coming on to back to a show basically saying we were wrong, but you can use, you know, Dr. Oz's formulation of vitamins or else the doctor from two would get on there or four or whatever and promote themselves because it was bandwagon. You know, they just joined it. Right. But they, you know, you know what happened anyway. Yeah. I so, think we're done unless anybody has one more. So, so Stefan Hartman says he uses synapsin for TBI and an intranasal BPC and TB4. Okay. Intranasal, <laughs> wonderful. Straight to the brain. I use injectable. Our patients use injectable. And we have over a hundred uh vets who were given disabilities, orthopedic disabilities. Those who have gone on to our tripeptide formulation of BPC-157, I, um, I, IGF-1-LR3, and uh, thymosin-4-beta, two weeks on, two weeks off, two weeks on, they're better. I just had one guy who had spinal fusion, L4-5 and S1, and according to his doctor, in four days, he was 95% to normal. In he four days... Well do you mix them all together in one syringe or do you give them separate? I mix them in one bottle. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Is that a daily injection or? Uh, you use uh, the formulation uh, to, to, to deliver the specific micrograms of each mm -hmm. is, um, is either given 0.1 cc's uh, twice a day or 0.2 once a day. I had rotator cuff. My wife injected me with uh, the formulation in three days, full range of motion, pain. Some of you know that uh, I was going into back surgery for L4-5 compression fracture with left side. And I woke up December 20th of last year, couldn't walk, couldn't put weight on it because of severe pain down the buttocks into the leg. Uh, what was it? Uh, L L4-5 S1, S2 root. And um, I went on to uh, a pregnizone, pregnizone uh, pulse for 10 days. It helped, but it didn't cure it. And uh, then I went on to the tripeptides for eight weeks and was doing really well, but I still had problems. I added a fourth peptide. And in seven to 10 days, I woke up on March 11th had absolutely no discomfort, nothing. It was like before it ever started. And I was scheduled for surgery on the 15th in Colorado with yeah. Dr. Duhan, Dr. Brad Duhan in Denver. Yeah. And uh, I called the anesthesiologist. Uh, you know, uh, Brad Villams? You know, Brad Villams, anesthesiologist, pain management? No, I don't. Yeah, he's gone through our program, became buddies. And uh, so I called him. He said, he's got this neurosurgeon. So I called Brad and I said, look, I woke up. I have no problems. I'm walking, no pain, nothing. Full range of motion, everything. He says, wait until tomorrow. Call me. That was Sunday. I called him. Still the same. Called him Monday. Still, he says, now we got to cancel the surgery. I said, no, I want the surgery. It was a disectomy, laminectomy. I said, because maybe this is just false sense of well-being and it's just going to come back. And the surgeon said, no. If you're having no pain, full range of motion, wait until it comes back. He said, but it's going to come back. It's been since March. And what I do is I work on my hillside, 45 degrees slope, uh, putting in trees, digging holes, pitch act, using a weed whacker, using all my garden tools, big, big time garden tools. No problem. You can't leave us hanging like that. What What's was the, the fourth? What What's was the fourth? fourth? What was the fourth hormone? You're not going to believe me. That's why I don't tell people. Yeah, we it's, will. It's, so a, it's a peptide for the skin. It's the, the GSK uh, CU. And it turns out there are two articles that talk about it's addressing neuro, neuron, neuro, neural inflammation and improving 
uh, blood flow to neurons. Yeah. And that's what I did. I added it. Uh, the fact that it's a nasty blue color, it stings going in, and it creates these little uh, lumps that take you know six months to disappear. I've got one left. But uh, I was using that on top of the tripeptide. And it could be coincidental. It could have been just the timing of the tripeptides. I don't know. Okay. Hopefully, I don't have to go back to the drawing board. I've always heard skin and brain are connected. Uh, well, the body's connected to the body. So I agree with you. Mm -hmm. It's all one thing, right? And we try to isolate it into heart and lungs. It's all working together, like all our hormones above the brain and below, I mean, above the neck and below the neck. All right. No more okay. questions. Thank you. Just one. If on testosterone, this is just to clarify, if you're on t testosterone, you're also giving DHEA and, and pregnenolone. Uh, right. And that's because I run the tests. Mm -hmm. And what you'll find is people coming in to get their testosterone fixed. It's low. Where does testosterone come from? Pregnenolone and DHEA. So if you don't have enough pregnenolone DHEA, you're not converting it, except in cases where you have mercury and lead toxicity. Mercury and lead interrupt the three beta hydroxy enzyme that converts DHEA to testosterone. So what we found in our guys from Bragg, a lot of them had that pattern. The software brought it to our attention. And um, it turned out the kill, you know, going into kill house, going into close quarter combat, you're breathing in mercuric chloride from the primer and you're breathing in lead oxide and lead particulate matter from the round that went through the chamber, you know, so you get a puff of mercury, mercury and, and mercury, uh, excuse me, uh, lead and mercury. So you need to check that. Okay. Okay. Great. All right. Okay, everybody. Thank you so much, Mark, Thank you. For, for everything. Um, we'll everybody, uh, we will be here again next week, same time, same station. And I had to come home because we had an internet problem at the office and I don't have my schedule in front of me. So I don't remember who's going to be here next week, but there will be somebody. Okay. <laughs> Maybe Take not care. as informative, but there will be somebody next week, same time, same station, 5 p.m. Pacific and <laughs> Eastern. Um, and um, have a great Thanksgiving. Um, and I, I hope, uh, uh, you know, I know a whole bunch of us are going to be at the A4M. So, um, you know, we, we should meet up somewhere um, since we um, uh, are you going to be there at all? You, you... No, they they don't want me there. Oh, they didn't want me either. So I just go to the to the thing. I, I just go yeah. to, to, to hang out with Stefan. And, and, yeah, and it's Burgess. because they thought they owned me. You know, I set them up in 1999. Yeah, they don't want me either. So yeah. we're we're we're, we're even. a traitor. They called me a traitor for lecturing for AMMG. Yeah. All right. So okay. All right. Bye everybody. bye everybody. Thank you so Thank much. You. Um, and well. we will uh, we'll see you again next week, same time, same station. Thank you so much, Mark. It Bro, was great. We'll do. Always okay. a pleasure, Thank Bill. You. Bye bye. Thanks everybody bye -bye. for listening. Thank okay, you. we'll have uh, I'll have the video. And I'll get that up. slides to them. Okay. Promise. Thank you. Uh, I'll have the video up on our um, website aosrd.org. And okay. also, um, I, apparently, I have my own uh, uh, YouTube channel now, and the, the, or, or these, wow. these, these, I didn't set it up. I have a person who does this, and and uh, most of the videos uh, for the last year are, are, are have been up there, um, are also on on Clearfield Medical Group on YouTube, um, and uh, we uh, we had uh, Dr. Beamer's. Uh, 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 we had a talk on COVID-19 uh, uh, long hauler syndrome and uh, they pulled it off and I got a warning. <laughs> so, you know, I'm just a bad boy. You know, the AOA doesn't want us. A4M doesn't want us. So uh, we don't right. care. That's <laughs> right. You do. John, you got anything for us? Good night, Mark. Thank you so much. Uh, blessings, right. Mark. Thank you. We'll do. Take care, everybody. Okay. Everybody else that's new here. Thank you so much for, for being here. Um, if you don't mind, we'll put you on our uh, mail list so that we can, um, you know, get, let you know what we're up to uh, from time to time. And um, it was a, a great, um, a great night. Thank you, everybody. Um, and uh, we thank Dr. Gordon. Um, and uh, we'll see you again next next week. Excellent. Thank, thank you. Have a, have a great, great job. Thank you, great David. Job. Have a great uh, holiday, John. Say hello to Sylvia for me. Um, yeah. Everybody that's new that we don't know, Dr. Berger, thank you for being with us, Dr. Quinn.
Um, and uh, there's some new names here. Hyla Cass is somebody new, and uh, Dr. Uh, uh, 48 Burnson is, is right. new names. There's a bunch of new names here. I hope you yeah, remember this. We're here. It's the same, it's the same link every week. Hi, oh, hi, Bill. Hey there. <laughs> hi, Bill. Hi. Hi. Thank hi. Thank you. Okay. There, David. Okay. Um, John, the uh the, the thing the thing in Reno didn't didn't happen. So okay. Um, uh that's not it's gonna happen. happen. Yeah. Right. Well, and, thank uh, you. So uh, right. we're hoping Dr. Halasa puts together, uh, uh, he's got me on some list, uh, I don't know, the, the day after on, on A4M, so the Sunday. So A4M okay. is Thursday to Saturday, so um, they're, they're still looking for a venue, so I don't know if that's going to happen either. You know, they, they thought they could, you know, you know, sneak in a room at the Venetian. Well, you know, <laughs> that's not, that, that, that's not inexpensive, so, um, so, um, um, I'll, I'll when I find out something, I'll let you know. Um, we do have if 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 you're hanging out for just for a minute, let me. Let, I want to share this with you. Let me um. Let me share my screen here. So Dot Mike Beamer has put together. I didn't want to. I don't want to mention it when Mark was here because you know he was very generous with our. Um. So can you see that? Yeah. Um, yeah. See this here. So Mike Wait. Beamer and, and Ron Kalatz have put together this um, uh, supplement. Um, it's going to be they're they're unrolling it at unveiling it at A4M. Um, it's uh, it's it's thirty. Um, uh, it's all the stuff we use in 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 one supplement. Um, and it's you need four capsules a day to get these. Can you can you read the um, the ingredients? Yeah, um, it has Maybe. all of these ingredients in it. Um, and it's it's got 30 um I think this mm. is all of them it's got 30 different um um uh, components to it and NAD coenzyme 10 n acetylcysteine pqq trans resveratrol uh, quercetin you can see it yourself um and uh, you can see the price there I I'm not involved with this so I mean I I I I, I don't get any any uh any any uh dollar remunerations for it so but you can see here it's 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 fairly complete it's kind of a shotgun approach i suppose um but um it's supposed to be two capsules twice a day um the price you see there is for a month um and they're going to be uh, rolling it out at, at a4m so um i i told them I, I would you know let let you folks know um and um if there's something that that you think might be a a, a um a help um, you know, it's uh, it, it will be available. So um, I, I don't think Mike's on right now, but um, that's um, so that's coming down the pike pretty quickly. Um, so, OK, everybody, um, th that's that's enough of the uh, commercial. <laughs> um, anything else, John? Everything's beautiful. Two two great lectures, two nights in a row. That's just fantastic. Well, guess what? I'm on again tomorrow night. I'm on Dr. Lewis's. Uh, um, oh man! I'm doing um I'm doing my uh it, it's become a favorite of mine. Nearly everything we learned about testosterone in medical school was wrong, <laughs> so yeah. so I'm doing that tomorrow night. So three nights in a row. It, it's a little bit much, but we'll we'll uh, we'll 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 handle it. So, and um, I, I actually the one I did last night, I actually rewrote the whole thing. I I like I said, I have I don't know if I told you, I have these two. Outfits, one in Canada, one in Australia, that are naturopaths. So they want, you. They want me to. Um, so I rewrote the one we did last night. I took out everything allopathic, so nothing prescription, and I put in just all the uh, the remedies and whatnot that I that that I could think of to boost testosterone, estrogen, to, to lower it. Um, and so we'll see if they like it or not. I don't know. The one's a homeopath. I don't really have much of a homeopathy on it. I, I know there is stuff. I'm just not that smart. So um, uh, I think I asked Dr. Nario. I don't know if he's still on to, to help me with it. He's 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 pretty knowledgeable on that stuff. And, you know, Dr. Zarin is with her gemotherapy, whatever the hell that is. I, I don't really know what that is, but <laughs> it's some sort of, you know, homeopathic remedy. So um, we'll let you know about that. So um, good seeing everybody. Have a great holiday. Um, and we'll talk to you soon. Um, I'll see you next week. Um, and you know, guys know where to get me if you need me. Okay. So good night. Great to see you, Thank Sylvia. You. Yep. yep. Bye, everybody. Take care, Sylvia. Sylvia. I second that. <laughs> Take care. <laughs>